Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Our speaker for the evening is a man from our own area, a member of the King School Group, well known for his activity in this fellowship, a Class B trustee, East Central Region of World Service Board of Alcoholics Anonymous, Bruce M. of the King School Group. Chairman Sid, Bill, Father Preposani, Monsignor, excuse me, Reverend McKee, fellow AAs and guests. First of all, I want to make note, as you probably have, that we, uh, have taken one page out of the Book of the Churches, and the uh, collection was taken up before the sermon. (laughs) I don't know how many of you live in Akron, or how many of those of you who do live in Akron saw the editorial in last night's Beacon Journal. But I'd like to read you uh, two paragraphs, both short, for the benefit of those who may not have seen it. And I quote, this is entitled, Akron's Great Gift, A.A. Of all the things of which Akronites can justifiably boast, our skills, our products, our people, one of the greatest is the fact that here was born Alcoholics Anonymous. This one organization and the good it achieves for alcoholics and their families is enough to set this city apart and above all others. And the second paragraph I wish to quote reads as follows. Through the late Dr. Walter F. Tunks of St. Paul's Episcopal Church and Mrs. Henrietta Sauberling, he met Dr. Bob and this is referring to Bill, and together they won their own battles against the battle and laid the foundation for Alcoholics Anonymous. Last night, I received the following telegram from New York City, and I quote, I would love to be with you on this wonderful occasion to review what in 30 years God has wrought. And am ha- happy that as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. My hope and faith as ever for you all. Signed, Henrietta. Now it's customary in AA meetings, and while this is not the usual AA meeting, it is customary for the speaker to begin the meeting by saying, uh, I'm an alcoholic. I'm not going to start that way. I'd like, first of all, to to uh, express my appreciation for being asked to speak at this meeting. 
And I, I, I wouldn't be fair or honest if I didn't say that I think it's a bit incongruous for me to even try to speak after you have heard one of the founders of this great organization. And all kidding aside, I would have been quite pleased after Bill finished his remarks to call it a day and go home. But when I became associated with Alcoholics Anonymous, one of the things that they said to me was that you will have to do whatever is reasonably asked of you. And accordingly, uh, this explains why I'm here. Most AA meetings, I think we can put in the category of, of medicine for us alcoholics. <coughs> this particular meeting, while it may qualify in that regard, is also something of a celebration because it was 30 years ago this month, as you all know, that AA started here. So I, while I am here because I was asked to appear, I want you to know I don't feel completely adequate to speak on the same program with Bill. And I think you'll understand this. Nevertheless, uh, here I am and I'll make the best of it. It's also customary in most of these AA meetings that the speaker gives something of his own background, qualifying as we call it, in order that the listeners may judge for themselves whether the speaker is competent to be up here talking. And this is why I would like to postpone for a few minutes the statement that I'm an alcoholic. I'm not an Akronite by birth. I came here to Akron in 1948 after I had been associated with AA for about three years, almost to the month. And I became associated with AA down in Canton, which is just about 20, 22 or 23 miles south. I attended my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous in October of 1945. And I'm very grateful to say to you that since that time I have not had a drink, I have not found it necessary to have a drink, and I have had during these some 19 plus years the freedom to drink or not to drink. When I attended that first meeting, and oddly enough, there is at least one man in the audience whom I saw from the platform as I was sitting there, who was at the first meeting that I attended down in camp. And I'll refer to him later on, if I may. But when I attended that first meeting, I didn't know that I was an alcoholic because I didn't know what an alcoholic was. At that time, I was going through the motions of practicing law in Canton. At that time, my family consisted of my wife and two children. And while I had known for a good many years 
that I was drinking too much. I'm sure that had my sponsors made it a condition preceding to attending that meeting, for me to admit that my life had become unmanageable, or that I was insane, I doubt very much whether I would have gone to the meeting. In spite of all the trouble I was having with drinking, in spite of the fact that I was under the influence, if not completely, passed out, perhaps six out of seven nights during the week. And in spite of the fact that each morning as I would get up, it was almost more than I could do to get myself together. It was almost too big a job to go, th go through the process of shaving because of the instability of my grip. And in spite of the fact that most of the time I would wear dark glasses, I don't know uh, what I expected these glasses to do for me unless it was to cover up the bloodshot eyes. And in spite of the fact that I couldn't write my name legibly until the day was pretty well through, and in spite of the fact that everybody, practically everybody that I knew, had told me that I was drinking too much. And in spite of the fact that I was sick every day, and really sick, and couldn't speak coherently sometimes because of what alcohol had done and was doing to my nervous system, in spite of all these things, not being able to sleep at night unless my system was thoroughly saturated with alcohol and in spite of the fact that alcohol had become an obsession with me that I thought about it almost every waking moment and by that I mean thinking about when the next drink was coming and where I was going to get it And in spite of the fact that I had apparently on many occasions by choice decided to sleep on the floor instead of the bed, whether it was the living room floor or the kitchen floor or wherever it may be, or perhaps in my automobile, You would think that anybody with any degree of intelligence would be able to recognize that he had a problem with alcohol. And yet, unfortunately, in my case, this is true in a lot of others. It didn't seem to me that alcohol was my real problem. I can't speak for other alcoholics, and I don't propose to. Whatever I say here tonight has application only to me. And if what I say fits your situation, fine. If it doesn't, you can forget it. Nevertheless, I'll stick my neck out and say that I do believe that a great many alcoholics have the same characteristics. And one of these characteristics is being 
completely self-centered to the point of great excess so that we think of, we can't think of anything except ourselves. It's literally impossible for us to view any situation except as it may affect us. This isn't true with the normal person. It seems to be possible for the normal person to have sufficient empathy with other people that he can put himself in the other person's shoes and think to himself what the other person is thinking and conduct himself accordingly. This isn't true with the alcoholic who's drinking. And this wasn't true in my case. Being self-centered to this extent and having some other characteristics which apparently some other alcoholics seem to have. Some of these are indulgence and self-pity. Some of these are arrogance, perhaps in an effort to cover up our real fear. A complete lack of self-confidence, and yet, paradoxically, simultaneously, a great deal of egotism. And I suspect it's this degree of self-centeredness which seems to engulf us, which makes it almost impossible for us to admit that our troubles are caused by our own conduct. And an alcoholic, as some of you know, is prone to blame people, circumstances, anything except himself for the predicament that he finds himself in. An alcoholic seems unable to, to grow up or to have grown up in the sense that he's capable of assuming the responsibility for having made certain voluntary choices. For example, in my case, I had chosen to become a lawyer. And yet, having become a lawyer, I wasn't satisfied. And I would sit at home drinking convincing myself that I should have been a doctor. As you grow up in this world, you have a great many choices. And the one I've just mentioned, of course, is the choice of vocation. Having made the choice, whatever it may be, a normal person is willing to stay with that choice and make the best of it. But an alcoholic like me doesn't seem to be able to do this. And so it is that we indulge in daydreams. And I suppose in my alcoholic daydreams I was the most competent surgeon in the entire world. Now, by the same token, and I speak again only for myself, I wouldn't accuse any other person of having these evil thoughts. By the same token, I had married the wrong girl. <laughs> and as I thought back, as I did frequently, I could think of any one of twenty. And these girls, incidentally, became prettier every year. But I could think of any one of 20 who would have been so much better than the one that I married. And similarly, 
I had four law partners at this time. Two of these were older men in their middle 60s. The other three of us were about the same age, our early 30s. As I say, I had four partners, and it seemed to me that I was doing all the tough work. <laughs> See, I had, I was unable to properly evaluate situations. And for no reason at all, at least no apparent reason, I would become very depressed And, of course, each time I became depressed, I would get worse and worse with my drinking. I didn't realize then that I was an alcoholic, and by the same token, I didn't realize that alcoholism was a progressive disease. I didn't know these things until I came to AA. All I knew was that I had a great many problems that I couldn't solve. I know that I behaved in a very peculiar manner, frequently. Just to give you one or two examples. On one particular Sunday, I recall, as though it were last week, you see, Sunday was a, a day that I could drink in the morning without feeling that I was a drunk. And after having had uh, a couple of drinks, the thought occurred to me that, that my wife had been neglecting my own family. That is, my mother and my mother's sisters and their children and husbands and so forth. So on this particular Sunday, about 11 o'clock in the morning, I said to my wife, uh, I think we ought to have a family dinner tonight. <laughs> well, you may imagine how this was received. There was some remonstrance on her part, some suggestion that perhaps it was a little late. The stores were closed on Sundays, at least most of them. Oh, I said that doesn't make any difference to it. We've got enough stuff. And so I got on the phone and began to call all the relations. I've forgotten how many there were, but when they arrived, when the first one arrived, where was I? I was upstairs, passed out. This was typical. And during the course of that evening, one of my uncles came upstairs where I was lying and said, Bruce, what in the hell are we going to do with you? And I said to him, I don't know, and I don't know that anybody will be able to answer that question until I can answer it myself. I think this was the truth. I was stating, unconsciously, I was stating the truth, because this is certainly true with an alcoholic. There isn't anything you can do with them, at least there wasn't in my case, until he's ready to do something himself. We sometimes call this as, as hitting bottom. Whether your bottom is relatively high or relatively low, or whether it's financial, or whether it's completely mental, doesn't seem to make much difference so long as you reach a point going down where you're unwilling to go any farther down and become willing to do anything which shows promise of starting you back the other way. This is the condition preceding to becoming associated with Alcoholics Anonymous. When the chairman read tonight 
the statement about Alcoholics Anonymous. If you recall, there was something in there that there are no dues or fees in AA. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. And yet I've heard it said, and I'm sure you've heard it said many and many a time, that this is probably the most expensive organization which exists in the world. And of course, they're speaking about the money which you dissipated before you were able to become associated with it. I was sitting down in the tavern one afternoon, and I began a silly exercise in arithmetic. I was trying to figure out how much it was costing me to drink. And after I had arrived at a figure of approximately $3,000 a year, I decided this was an exercise in futility, that this is something that I shouldn't even worry about, and so I gave it up. Needless to say, this didn't keep me from drinking and didn't keep me from getting worse. Now there comes a time as I mentioned earlier, where you reach the bottom, my time happened to come in October of 1945, and it wasn't because I hadn't had an opportunity to come to AA before that, because two or three years before that particular month, I had been brought to Akron by one of the doctors in Canton to meet Dr. Bob. And Dr. Bob spent an hour and a half or perhaps even two hours in his very gracious and yet matter-of-fact Vermont way those of you who recall Dr. Bob will remember that he meant no words. Vermonters seldom do. And they don't waste any words. But Dr. Bob told me some of his own experiences. And I couldn't help but feel that he, he drank too much whiskey or had, and I thought to myself, thank God I'm not as bad as this fellow was, and when he said to me, young man, and I wish I were that young again, I guess I was 32 or 33, he said, young man, if you really want to stop drinking, if you'll come up to Akron, we'll put you in the hospital for five days. We'll give you a copy of the Bible, and you can lie in bed for five days and read the Bible and meditate. Well, you, you may imagine how much appeal this had to a intellectual snob. I drank through college without getting into serious trouble. In fact, I, as I look back, one of the high points in my college career was being invited to join one of the two secret drinking societies. I considered this quite an honor. I drank my way through law school. I drank my way through a year of graduate school in law. I taught in Philadelphia at one of the universities in the law school for some five years, four years. I began then unconsciously a sort of a geographic cure that we hear about. This was not done with any malice or forethought on my part. And I left Philadelphia and I went to Washington where I spent two years. The only 
early deliberation I had in connection with drinking for that move was that I made up my mind that I wasn't going to drink quite so much. But they sold whiskey in Washington, same as they had in Philadelphia. In fact, it was easier to get because you could buy it at almost any drugstore. In fact, you could buy it wholesale very easily. And the first night that I arrived in Washington, by chance, I called one of my former law school friends. And it happened that he had an apartment sufficiently large for two people, and his his apartment mate or roommate, as you want to call it, had left the week before. And so he invited me to share this apartment. And the first night I was there, he said, shall we buy some drinking whiskey? He was a southerner, and down south they distinguish between cooking whiskey and drinking whiskey. And I said, sure, let's, let's get some. He said, we can get it cheaper if we buy it by the case. And I said, all right, let's buy a case. And so we split the cost of this this case of Scotch whiskey. I lived with that fellow for almost a year, in fact, over a year, I guess it was. And that's the last time he ever paid half of whiskey for me. He was one of these queer drinkers who might drink one drink before dinner. I never understood a person who did that. I don't understand them to this day. But you've seen them. They go around cocktail parties. They may nurse a drink for an hour and a half, and they may not have another one for a week. Just a waste of alcohol. (laughs) During this time I spent with this man in Washington was the first time that anybody had talked with me seriously about my drinking. And it was he who brought it up. I had been called a drunk. During my law school days, the president of the university had made a special trip over to the law school to try to encourage the dean to kick me out of school because of the bad influence I was having on the other people. And when I was teaching in Philadelphia, I was known as the drunken professor. But in spite of these things, this man was the first one that ever tried to talk to me seriously. And as a result of his talk, I began what I now know to be a series of of attempts to control drinking. One of the uh, usual ones, of course, is to drink nothing but beer. Well, I never liked beer in the first place. In the second place, uh, I, I found that I couldn't drink that much beer that I needed. One of the other ones was to try drinking bourbon instead of scotch. I don't know what that theory was, but I kept getting drunk just the same. One of my friends came back from Montreal one time, and he said, I found a a wonderful way to drink without getting drunk, no hangovers. He said, you drink a glass of milk every time you drink a couple ounces of whiskey. Well, I tried this, but you know you can't drink that much milk. (laughs) One of the last ones I tried, and there was some logic to this one, never drink after dinner. Now, of course, the theory was that if you had some food in your system, the food would absorb the alcohol, and if you didn't take any more, you wouldn't get so drunk. And this worked pretty well for a couple of days. We were accustomed to having dinner about 7 o'clock. And as the week went on, the dinner hour got later. And by the end of the week, it was midnight. (laughs) 
And the last day of this experiment, I didn't get to dinner, and my friend had to go by himself. Then he got married and invited me to find another place to live, which I did. And then, of course, I really felt sorry for myself because I had no companion now. And in one of these drunken philosophizing sessions that I had with myself, it occurred to me that the answer to my problem was to get married. See, this undoubtedly was, was caused by my friend's example. And being afflicted with long-distance telephonitis, which some alcoholics seem to be afflicted with, I put in a long-distance call for this gal up in Boston, and after asking her whether it was raining or snowing, I said, how about getting married? Now, this was an odd thing because I hadn't heard from her for three or four years. <laughs> you know, an alcoholic, once he, he makes up his mind to do something, damn it, he wants to do it now. <laughs> Those of you who have alcoholic spouses, if you've had the experience of your husband saying, I think I'll buy a new automobile, I bet you a cookie you have it before the day's over. <laughs> and if it's a new house, and if you go around to look at the new home with him, the first damn house you get into, he'll say, let's take this one. <laughs> he wants to live his life all today. And he can't do it. Well, the next night, this girl called me back to see whether I had recalled the conversation of the evening before. <laughs> and while I was a little hazy about it, uh, the fundamentals were still there, and I, I repeated the proposition. And the upshot was, this was uh, November sometime, the upshot was we were married on December 23rd, that same year. This turned out to be a mistake. <laughs> My drinking got worse overnight. <laughs> the only way I can explain this is because my wife was a very competent automobile driver, and therefore, it wasn't necessary for me to try to keep sufficient control of my conduct in order that I could get myself home. And it seems to me that I, during this period, I lost the last vestiges of self-control and self-discipline. I had occasion to be operated on that following spring, and the doctor who performed the operation said to my wife, after the operation was over, he said, you know, it took us over an hour to put your husband to sleep, because his system was so saturated with alcohol, and you better tell him, as soon as he's able to understand these things, but if he doesn't stop drinking, he's going to kill himself. And within a couple of days, when I apparently was feeling better, she told me. And instead of taking this seriously, I couldn't wait till I got one of my friends to sneak me in a pint so I could drink it to see if it would kill me. She did, and I did, and it didn't. And so I went on. The next hope I had was that if we were fortunate enough to have a child, then life would take on some meaning. Now we had an opportunity to move from Washington way out to California, probably as far away as we could go. And I thought to myself, this, this is my opportunity 
to get away from these evil drinking companions. And if by chance, as I mentioned, if by chance we have an offspring, then life will really become worthwhile. This is a good job. I uh, was back to teaching in one of the law schools in California, and I thought everything was going to be fine, but it wasn't. We had a child there, our first one, and again, instead of my drinking improving from the sense of drinking less, I began to drink more. And you may say, how is this possible? Well, I, I don't know, but this is what happened. And I suppose the cause of this was the fact that now my wife was paying more attention to the little baby than she was the big one. I don't know, but... So I became uh, very much depressed again, uh, having tried moving twice, and finally I concluded after a year out there that, oh, I better go back where people, quote, understood me, close quote. Alcoholics seem to be the most misunderstood people in the world. And much against my wife's better judgment, we moved back to Ohio, back to camp. And I made this association with some of my friends, one of whom was a particularly good friend, and I began practicing law. Had they known about my drinking proclivities, I'm sure they would have been most reluctant to take me in. But after being home for a couple of months, they noticed it, and they said, what in the hell's the matter with you? And, of course, the only explanation I could give them was that I was of a nervous disposition. That this kind of work, jury trials, and this kind of thing that I had had no prior experience with. And as soon as I got acclimated to this sort of a routine, I was sure that my drinking would get back to normal. Well, I never did get adjusted. Of course, my drinking got worse. And finally came the day when I reached the end of the rope. This was not a very pleasant week. It happened to be my wife's birthday sometime during the weekend. And uh, her brother, her first cousin, with whom she grew up and really was a brother, was visiting us, and this gave me some legitimate excuse for drinking openly instead of sneaking down the basement or out to the garage or wherever it may be. And so when Monday came, I wasn't able to get out of bed. And my wife and her Brother, I'll call him that because that's what he was in fact, if not in law. I could tell they were discussing me. Time they would leave, of course, I'd sneak down and get a couple of doubles and back to bed. And so when Tuesday came, I wasn't able to get up either. And between the two of them, they decided that something had to be done. And they asked me if I would go to a sanitarium, and I said, all right, anything to get away from this mess. In the meantime, they called a couple of AAs, and Thursday of this week, two AAs came out to see me. My wife had made a reservation at some sanitarium in Massachusetts, never got there. And that night, uh, Oh, and when the two AAs were there, I promised to go to a meeting on Saturday if I were in town. I made this promise very glibly because I didn't expect to be there. I expected to be in Massachusetts. But that night, the, the uh, clan gathered to decide what to do with the corpse. And sometime during that evening, 
one of my law partners came up and he said, Bruce, if you go to the sanitarium, we don't want you to come back. This I couldn't understand. I, I didn't understand how they could get along down there without me. And then he said, and besides that, from what you've been telling me, I don't think drinking is your problem. I think you ought to divorce your wife. <laughs> and so from the group of mourners, I called my wife upstairs and advised her about the change in plans. And all hell broke loose. And the mourners began to choose sides. But I was a stubborn alcoholic. And when all the people went home, it was agreed that, that I would take my wife and the kids back to Boston, leave them there, and we would work out some arrangement. And the next morning, much to my surprise, when I woke up, about the first thing my wife said to me was, I'm not going. And I said, why not? Well, she said, I don't believe you're in any condition to make any rational decisions. I married you for better or worse, some emphasis on the latter, and I've decided I better stay here and see this thing through. And again, in, I say typical, perhaps it wasn't, but in my alcoholic, juvenile fashion, I started to pack my suitcase. And she said, where are you going? I said, I'm going home to mother. Thirty-five years old, two children, supposedly an adult person, but I'm going home to mother. So I took my suitcase and I went downtown and I, I, uh, I called my mother and I said, uh, I've temporarily separated from my wife and uh, would it be all right if I come out and stay with you? And there was complete silence. <laughs> it seemed like five minutes. Of course, it wasn't. See, the relationship between my mother and me had somewhat deteriorated. She had a very acute sense of smell. And it seems, it seemed as though she could smell alcohol over the telephone line. She hated alcohol, and of course this meant that I couldn't go to see her because I always had it on my breath. But being a very dutiful son, I'd call her once in a while, and the conversation would go something like this. I'd say, hello, mother, and she'd say, hello, you're drinking again. <laughs> and finally, she said, all right, I suppose it would be all right for you to come out here. And then having made sure that I had a place to lay my head, I called my wife back and said, I've got this all figured out. I'll stay here with my mother downtown here, and you stay up in the country with the kids, and I won't bother you, and don't you bother me. And if I can stay sober until the 1st of January, then you'll have to admit that you've been the cause of all this trouble. And we can work out some amicable arrangement. And she said, all right, if that's the way you want it. And I said, that's the way I want it. And so I went home to Mother that night. And I had a copy of the AA Big Book that these two men had left with me. And as I lay there in bed, I thought, maybe I'll start to read this book. And you know, I thought it was the worst stuff I'd ever read in my life. No offense, Bill. I thought it was trite. How any intelligent person could swallow that stuff was beyond me. 
And then I turned to the second half of the book and I began to read the stories. And I became intensely interested in the stories because even in my poor physical condition, it was quite apparent to me that these people whose stories were in the book behaved in the same way I did. And so I began to wonder if these people are admittedly alcoholics, maybe I am. And so now I come back to where I began. What is an alcoholic? See, I think you've got to be able to answer this question before you can say, I'm an alcoholic or that I'm powerless over alcohol and my life has become unmanageable. I don't know what your definition is of an alcoholic. There are many. The only one that I've ever seen that makes much sense is that a person's an alcoholic when drinking interferes with his life against his will, either in a business way, a social way, or a domestic way. And using this as a test, and with the example of these stories, I began to wonder whether I wasn't an alcoholic. And I went to the meeting that Saturday night, much against my will. I don't believe I have ever felt more ashamed in my life, either before or since, than I did that night. I had no desire to associate with Romans. This is a little of a paradox, too. I had no, apparently had no compunctions about people seeing me drunk in public or in private. And yet when I considered people knowing that I had become associated with a group of Rummies, this gave me a great feeling of shame. This is where they separate the men from the boys, if you're an alcoholic. Am I going, this is the question I think you ask yourself, even though the, the analysis may be faulty. Am I going to associate with a bunch of rummies and lose all of my law business such as it is? and probably never get another client because, after all, who would be so silly as to bring business to an alcoholic, an admitted alcoholic? Am I going to do that with some chance of staying sober? Or am I going to continue to drink, and if these people are right, continue to drink until I end up in an institution or die an alcoholic's death. But it's a little like Hobson's choice when you think about it. If you want to live, and if you like yourself as I like me, I think most of us have a great deal of admiration for ourselves, as lousy as we may be. So it really wasn't much of a choice. My sponsors made it perfectly clear to me that, that if I was an alcoholic and this was something for me to decide, then I better take it very seriously because it was the difference between life and death. And I believe it. At that first meeting, I met people and I began to feel that I wasn't the unique kind of person that I had thought I was. They told me that alcoholism was a disease, which was a very comforting thing. You know, it's one thing to be called just an old drunk, as I've been called many times. It's quite another to say that you're afflicted with a disease, poor fellow. You know, you feel sorry for yourself then. I can't help it. 
I've, I've caught this disease somehow or other. And they pointed out to me this one man who's here tonight. And they said, Bruce, there's a man who went completely blind drinking bootleg whiskey. And with that tremendous handicap, that fellow has managed to stay sober for five years. Up to the day, up to the day, because he was willing to accept what AA had to offer, and because he has tried to the best of his ability to follow the suggestions of the AA program. And I thank God that my reaction to that was, if that fellow can stay sober with this tremendous handicap, then perhaps there is something to this AA program, and perhaps I better give it the old college try. And I began to go to a lot of meetings. After a week, I called my wife. I was getting a little lonesome. And I told her that I'd been going to AA meetings for that all that week. And I said, I'm beginning to believe that perhaps you haven't been entirely responsible for my difficulties, and I think I better come home. And she said, all right, uh, if you want to come home, it's okay. And I went home, and I've been home ever since. I had some trouble not with drinking, but with thinking. As you recall, the second half of our first step says my life or our lives had become unmanageable. I wasn't quite willing to concede this. And the second step says that we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore us, could restore us to sanity. And I said to myself, how in the world can you get restored to sanity unless you're insane? And I wasn't willing to accept this. And it said in step number three that we made a decision to turn our will and the care of our lives over to God as we understood him. And I said to myself, how can I do this when I, I don't even know whether there's a God? Far less understanding. So it seemed to be really an insurmountable project to follow these suggested steps. And then one of my AA friends said, read that second step again. And it said, we came to believe. It wasn't necessary that you believe when you came in. And so I was advised to keep coming to meetings keep exposing myself to the philosophy of AA and keep my ears open and my mouth shut and see what would happen. I read everything I could about alcoholism. I reread Bill's story in the big book. And I reread Bill's story in the big book again. And I reread it again, and I said, my God, I haven't had any spiritual experience like this fellow's had. I haven't had any angels appear before me. I haven't seen any, any evidence of a spiritual experience of any kind. And so I, I was troubled. And I uh, happened to think one day about a poem that I had had to memorize as part of my elementary school education. And it went something like this. This is Abu Ben Adam by Leigh Hunt. Abu Ben Adam, may his pride increase, awoke one night from a deep dream of peace and saw within the moonlight of his room, making it rich and like a lily in bloom, an angel writing in a book of gold. 
Exceeding peace had made Ben Adam bold, and to the presence in the room he said, What writest thou? The vision raised its head, and with a look made of all sweet accord answered, The names of those who love the Lord. And is mine one? said Abu. Nay, not so, replied the angel. Abu spoke more low, but cheerily still, and said, I pray thee then, Write me as one that loves his fellow men. The angel wrote and vanished. The next night it came again with a great wakening light and showed the names whom love of God had blessed and lo, then Adam's name led all the rest. I thought too of, of uh, another quotation that I had had occasion to to uh, memorize in school. This came from Shakespeare's Hamlet. This was part of Polonius's advice to his son Laertes. This above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night to day. Thou canst not then be false to any man. And so I went along in AA, and I thought, all right, if I don't believe in a God, or if I don't have any concept of God that I can believe in, I'll be a little bit like Abu Ben Adam, and I'll try to love my fellow men. One night I heard a man say that he'd had approximately six months of sobriety, whereas prior to coming into AA, uh, two weeks had been the longest time he'd been able to stay sober. And he said he too had been looking for a spiritual experience, and he wondered why he couldn't consider this six months sobriety as being a spiritual experience. And this made a lot of sense to me. And so I went home that night, and I gave this a lot of thought, and I said, all right, let's consider this. I've had maybe seven months of sobriety at that time. So let's consider this as a spiritual experience. And about this time, there was a book that was published called Peace of Mind by Rabbi Joshua Liebman, which became very popular. There are two chapters in that book that I reread with some degree of regularity. One is chapter 3, entitled, Love Thyself Properly. And the other one is chapter 8, which is entitled, Thou Hast Enthralled Me, God. And I do believe that this particular writing helped me to realize that I was an immature person. That if I was going to do more than just stay sober, and I was staying sober, but if I was going to make anything of my life and regain the ambition that I had lost, that somehow or other I was going to have to grow up along the lines that Dr. Liebman talked about. And if I was going to achieve any peace of mind and serenity, somehow or other I was going to have to develop some concept of God which I was able to accept. Or to put it another way, I was going to have to learn how to live with myself and be relatively happy with me. This is quite a chore. This is a daily chore, a never-ending chore. And I believe that for me particularly, maybe not for any other alcoholic, but certainly for me, this is going to be a chore, a daily chore for the rest of my life. One of my AA friends in New York made the statement that when 
an alcoholic is a drinking alcoholic. The trouble is that life is so daily. And you know this is the trouble. The damn thing's there every day. I have found that by making an effort, a serious effort, to follow the principles of this program, that not only have I been able to stay sober, which is after all the primary purpose of why I attend these meetings and why I'm here tonight, but I have found that because of this effort, I have been able to grow up a little bit, and I have been able to accept the consequences of decisions that I have made voluntarily and accept the responsibility for those consequences. I have learned, too, many, many things in AA. There was a fellow over at Kent University back in 1948 who wrote his master's degree he called it, his thesis was called, A Survey of Alcoholics Anonymous. And one of the questions that he raised in this article was whether the process of re-socialization, as he put it, as it operates in AA, prepares the alcoholic for adequate participation in community activities, or whether he finds that his social adaptability extends no further than the confines of his AA group. And I'm sure that if that man wrote a supplement to his thesis, all he would have to do would be to look around him to see that AAs do accept responsibility for community activities. And I think it can be truly said that most AAs who have tried their best to practice these principles in all of their affairs have become better people, better citizens in their community, and better members of society than they ever would have been had they not been alcoholics at all. I'm thoroughly convinced of this. I know, too, that in order to maintain any degree of happiness, it's absolutely essential that we try to help the other fellow. Call it the golden rule, if you like. It's absolutely essential that we give ourselves away in order that we may grow in stature. And I would like to leave with you this thought. In fact, I would be delighted if I could honestly say to you that this is the way I live. I try to, but I can't. It's not for me to say whether I do or not. This is an anonymous piece which goes like this. I expect to pass through this world but once. If there is any good, therefore, that I can do or any kindness that I can show to any fellow creature, let me do it now. Let me not defer it or neglect it, or I shall not pass this way again. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and God bless all of you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.